Praise the Lord. Let's begin. Um, this morning I'd like to uh, preach upon the topic or, or the thought, um, my cup runneth over. Or how does my cup runneth over? Um, y- you could take this as a, a message on giving. I don't know, what springs to your mind? You say, the, the person stands up the front and says, I'm preaching on giving today. And I don't know about you, but my, my mind starts to spring, oh, he's after a tithe, he's after an offering. I don't know, is that what you thought? No? Oh, it's just me. (laughs) Preaching on giving. Preaching on Luke 6, 35 to 38. Give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down and shaken together and running over, shall men give into your bosom. Hmm. Okay, let's go there. Luke chapter 6. I don't know, maybe we're all going to take the message a little bit differently this morning. Over in Luke chapter 6, and we'll read 35 to 38 in a minute. Prosperity, you cannot argue, is firmly engraved in especially the latest generation, Gen Y. The church uh, uh, groups throughout um, Australia, America and other, other countries have seen it in Africa. It's no lie, it's got to be the truth, is that right? That it's firmly engraved. Prosperity is a, is a high priority. There's no lie in that. That's the truth. That's just uh, what's out there. Um, You might not agree with the doctrine. You might uh, agree with part of the belief that God prospers his children. I don't know. We'll explore these thoughts today. But you cannot change the fact that it's out there and it's quite strong. It's a movement that's been around for a very long time. If you look it up, study its history, it's been around for a very, very long time. It's nothing that's come out very new. It's been out there since the 80s and before that as well. Of course, we have preachers like T.D. Jakes that believes that prosperity, or sorry, poverty, is a barrier to living a Christian life. That wealth makes it easier to make a positive impact on society. And so you can see that there is some logic in what they're saying. There is some logic that they believe that it's, uh, with wealth it's easier to make a positive impact on society. So, of course, they have some truth in it. They're never going to mix it and come out straight with lies. Of course... Um, Depending on your, on your background, this may or may not have been a big thing in your church group. Prosperity and what it truly was. So let me ask you this morning, what is your belief? Your physical prosperity, your physical or your spiritual prosperity, what is the most important thing? Don't answer, just think about it this morning. Let's go to Luke chapter 6 and we're going to read from verse 35. But love your enemies and do good. And lend, hoping for nothing in return, and your reward shall be great. And ye shall be the children of the highest, for he is kind unto the unthankful and to the evil. Be ye therefore merciful, even as your Father also is merciful. Judge not, and ye shall not be judged. Condemn not, and ye shall not be condemned. Forgive, and ye shall be forgiven. Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, and shaken together, and running over... Shall men give into your bosom? For with the same measure that ye meet with all, shall it be measured to you again. Now that is an exciting verse. I don't care what you believe it means. If you believe it, it's, it's a physical thing, well, you ought to be on your feet excited, shouting. Shouldn't you? And if you believe it's a spiritual thing, then you ought to be excited. You ought to be happy. You ought to be glad to read a verse like this. If you believe it's something good for your life, you ought to be thankful. You ought to be excited. Now, dare I say, many of us, perhaps many moons ago, may have been up on our feet shouting about this verse. When someone would get up and ran rave and and really get into this verse, press down, shaken together, and put to you that you cannot handle all this blessing in one. It's true. Many of us would have been on our feet. Amen. Hallelujah. It's truth. It's good. I want it. Yes? Yes? I would have been one. I would have said yes. And you know what? Today, I still say yes. I still say I want the blessing. If God wants to give me something that's that good, that's that good, then you ought to want it too. You ought to want a blessing. Does anyone not want a blessing?
It still be ought to be us today. God's promises haven't changed. You know what man does with Scripture? He can do whatever he wants. He can turn it into whatever he wants. But God hasn't changed His Word. The Word still says the same thing. Luke 6 verse 38 still says the same thing as it said back then. Now what you believe it means to you might be different, but that doesn't mean that God's changed. God still blesses. God still wants to bless. Do you believe that? Do you want that? I want you to ask yourself this morning, how much do you want that? Do you still have that testimony that God blesses today, just like He did back then? Or do you feel the blessings are more from this life? That you get a higher feeling, a greater joy from the things that this world can offer? I want you to ask yourself that this morning. The feelings that I get... Is it a better feeling when I get a good result from business, from people giving me something, or getting, gaining things, material things? What gets you off your seat this morning? What would it take for you to really jump up and be really excited and say, I want that, or I'm excited about that? I want you to ask yourself this morning, what is it? Is it a psalm? Is it a hymn? Is it a sport? Is it a thing? What is it that really gets you excited? My motive this morning is not to get you built up and to go high as the sky and then tomorrow shoot way back down. But I want to see what's on the inside. I want to remind you of what once was your drive and passion and zeal and thing that would give you that fuzzy feeling and and buzz the hairs on your neck up. I remember being in those spots. I remember feeling those things, brothers and sisters. I'm preaching to myself as well this morning. I want to talk to you about a blessing. I want to talk to you about a blessing that cannot be contained. A promise from God. Today I haven't come to bag out and to mock other groups or what they believe from this verse promises. I haven't come to talk about them and what they believe and make fun of them and make us feel good in that way. This is not what the scripture, I don't believe what, this is what our motive or our thoughts or our passion should ought to be. But I want to discover truly what is this scripture about. I want to share what I believe that Jesus was truly teaching and let God be judge. So why don't we start and find out truly what this is not. We start that way. He starts off and he says, Give and it shall be given unto you. Pressed down, packed, compressed, Shaken together, running over, overflowing if you like. Fill my cup, Lord. Do you remember that song? I lift it up, Lord. No? Bread of heaven, fill me till I want. I can take no more. This blessing that we read here, to me, speaks of a blessing that is not able to be contained, not able to be handled. Whatever this is talking of, it will be given in such a manner the receiver will not be able to contain it all. And it will overflow them. I mean, this is exciting. This this is something worth exploring. Do we understand it? Do we we want it? Do we even have a hunger to want it? You see, yes, we could all come and say, this is an old scripture, Tim. I've seen this. It's not a physical thing. We know that. This is boring. But do you really understand it? Do you really want it? Because I think it's more than what we can just read here and simply pass aside. Where is the hunger to receive these things? Is it in you or I, brothers and sisters? What it cannot be, well first, if we want to take this scripture literally, then we should take the couple of scriptures before it literal also. Verse 20, blessed are the poor. You don't see too many people saying, make me poor. I want to be poor. I want to be lonely. For yours is the kingdom of God. I don't know about you, I haven't seen too many people crying out, make me poor, God, if they want to take it literal, or if you want to take it literal. Verse 24, but woe unto you that are rich, for ye have your consolation. Woe if you're rich. Christ, was he a rich man? In the physical. His preaching was not to get people wealthy, amen. He said, poor, Blessed are the poor. And he said about the rich, woe unto them. 
So to me, the first of all points that we see in this portion of Scripture cannot lead to a physical thing. It cannot, because it, it contradicts each other. Because you'd have a lot of rich people making themselves poor. Amen? He said in Luke 12, verse 15, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. It doesn't consist in this life. Christ taught that it does not consist in the things that you have, the things that you wear. They were not his passion. They were not his drive. He did not leave the house each day to go and tell people to get more physical things and build up their earthly kingdom. Amen? Amen. It's good for us to know these things. It's good for us to remember these things. It's good for us to be reminded of these things. It's the same today as it was back then. It's the same today as Jesus' words back then. Do not put your trust in the arm of the flesh. Do not trust in these things because they cannot give you what Jesus was truly talking about. Take heed and beware of covetousness, for a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of that which he possesses. We think we're so different today. We think, well, Jesus, that was way back then, nothing like today. Brothers and sisters, it's still the same. He said back then, don't worry about what people have. It's not what they truly are. It's exactly the same today. People try and make who they are by what they have. But it's not what a man possesseth that maketh the man. Amen. Luke 18, verse 24. Well, let's go to Luke 18. We'll read about, of course. Luke certainly had a lot of things to say about rich and poor, physical and spiritual. <clears throat> Luke 18, verse 24. Uh, let's start a little bit earlier than that. Back in verse 18 there, he has a certain rich, rung, rich r certain ruler asked him and said, Good master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And of course he goes through on the things that he needs to have followed to, to uh, get the eternal life. And he says all these things in verse 21. Have I kept from my youth up? Now, when Jesus heard these things, he said, Yet thou lackest one thing, sell what thou hast, and distribute it unto the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and follow me. Treasure in heaven, and you'll follow me. Give away, you know, sell everything you have, give it away, and follow me, and you'll have so much. And over in verse 24, when he saw that, he was very sorrowful. And Jesus said, How hardly they, shall, uh, they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God. How hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God. This man wanted, obviously, to be part of the kingdom. And Jesus told him, Well, you have to sell. Not a, not a mixed up thing here. You need to sell what you have. Give to the poor. Give it away. Give it away. And you'll have so much more. But yet he was sorrowful. And Christ's comments was, How hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? It's difficult. It's not easy. It's not impossible, of course. But those that are rich, of course, can be entangled with the snares of this life. Those that want to be rich can be entangled with the lust of riches and the lust of wanting to be rich. Not necessarily having the money, but wanting to be rich. Jesus Christ never taught these riches were a blessing from God in that particular way. These scriptures cannot be talking about bringing a material blessing because Jesus tells us the opposite. It wasn't about the physical. Jesus Christ told us the opposite. This rich young ruler had it. And if it was the right thing, he would have said, keep it and just come and follow me. But he said, sell it because it was his desire, his center. You see, back then, the Jews, of course, wanted a king that would bring them prosperity, that would deliver them from the Romans, amen? They wanted a king that would provide them a kingly kingdom, if I can put it that way. Uh, king, they liked things just like we have rich people or people that like high and lofty places was like just, just back then. You had them then, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They liked the position. They liked the power. They liked the money. And you had the rich people that liked all those things too. It's the same. There is no difference. I think sometimes, brothers and sisters, we can get the mindset, well, like everyone said, oh, well, that was way back then, you know, but now is a different time. 
It was the same. In fact, more so perhaps because the Jews wanted that material. They wanted that physical king. They wanted him to give them power, authority. The good news is these scriptures must be something better, amen, than a physical thing. They must be something better than dollars and cents. Hey, we all know that we can get dollars and cents and then the next day it's gone. You know, you think you're just getting somewhere sometimes in business and then all of a sudden the tax man comes. Or P-A-Y-G or whatever they call it, whoever that man is. You know, it's got to be better than the houses. It's got to be better than the cars. Otherwise, Christ said, well, I'm going to give you them first and then I'm going to give you something else. It's got to be better than the dresses and the suits. It's got to be better than the flower that fades away. This blessing has got to be better. This blessing, uh, blessing has got to be incomparable to this earthly substance that we can get. Things of this world are incomparable to the blessing that God can truly give. Christ walked the earth, amen? We see all these scriptures, but let's think about it logically. Christ walked the earth. He was born to a family of no royal or prestige background. Come on, let's get serious. He was born in a manger. Now, unlike the ones we see at the plaza and the shops, they're not clean. Are they, Gab? A, a, a manger or a stable. They usually smell, don't they? No matter how relatively clean they are. Yes? So unlike the ones we see in Christmas Day and, and leading up to those beautiful little mangers with it all nice and clean and no smells, he wasn't born in a three-star or five-star hotel. He was born in a manger, in a feeding trough. Let's get real about Jesus Christ's life. He wasn't born in the lap of luxury. He wasn't born to a family of prestige with a, a physical father that could provide his every need. Was he? It would be foolish to, for us to think that he was walking around with such a large bank account and that he had so much stored up for himself because Christ himself said that he had no place to lie his head. Is that right? So surely we know from his life alone that he was not placing his bets on physical things to bring satisfaction. Amen. But he said... Even though he had none of these things, he still said that he had a life. In fact, he said to the woman that was at the well, I have the water of life that will never let you be thirsty again. It'll satisfy you like none of the water that this well could ever provide. He said that even though he didn't have any of those great and physical, wonderful things. He said that he had the truth but he had no great degree. He was no great philosopher in the eyes of men. Yet he said he had the truth and he said he had the way. He said he had rest, even though he had no great place to go and lie his head. He said he had peace that he could give to anyone that would pass all understanding. These were not physical things, amen. These were not physical things. He said that he had riches to share. And he said that he had better things than this world could ever think to offer. Brothers and sisters, Christ had a life with nothing of material. All good things that he had and he wanted to share were spiritual. Amen. Back to Luke 6. Luke chapter 6. And we were at verse 38. I hope that we see from these things, of course, that money and mammon was definitely not Christ's drive. It was not what he was talking about. It was much more than that. It was a spiritual blessing. Matthew 10 and 8 says, Freely you've received, freely give. Freely give. Freely you've received, brothers and sisters. Freely you've received spiritual food, spiritual blessings. Freely it's time to give. We're called to give, amen. We're called to give and I'm not talking about dollars or sponsorship. The scriptures have called us to give. The start of the scripture says give. Is that right? Give. And this is really what I want to talk about today. 
We have been called to be a people of giving. Of giving, not taking, not of hoarding or building up. People of giving. Amen? We're called to give. And after we give, we're called to give again. And even after we get kicked, even after we get pushed down, mocked and slapped on the face for giving, we've been called to give again. And you know what? I know that it's not easy. I know after many years of giving and giving and slapping and getting kicked down and getting picked up and then giving and then getting slapped down again, it's not easy to give. Amen? It's not easy. But the Bible's called us to give. And to give again. So let me ask you, what do you do? And I hope you realize what I'm talking about. I know what it's feeling like when you give and you give and you feel like you've just given all and you just get slapped down again. But what do you do after years of that? What do you do after feeling that way that you've been knocked down and you just feel like never getting up again? Do you stop giving? Do you close yourself off? Do you judge and do you make the call, well, I'm going to give to this person and to that person and I'm going to give to maybe strangers, maybe some brethren. What do you do when you feel like you've just given all and no one has taken what you've given? Do you know what I'm talking about? Because it's, it's a thought. Well, do you stop? Do you close yourself off? Do you decide who to give to? And who you're just not going to give to at all? But brothers and sisters, God just said give. He called us to give. And even after we feel like that, He's called us to get back up and give. He's called us to give to our family, to our friends, to strangers, to brethren. He's called us to give. You see, if we don't give, you know what happens? We start to dry up. If we don't give, if we don't, if we decide and we think, well, we'll just choose on who we're going to give and what merits we're going to give them, we begin to dry up. And one day it will turn to perish because you need to give to receive. Where is that thanks? Where is that testimony? Where is that psalm? Where is that hymn? You know, it's not easy. I know, and I'm there with you, brothers and sisters. It's not easy sometimes to just simply give after feeling like you've given your all. And I'm not talking this morning about just delivering. There's a difference between just delivering and giving. Anyone can deliver. Anyone can get up and, and deliver things, deliver the message, well, you're a sinner and you need to be saved. And you know, you haven't done right and you need this and you need that. There's a difference between just delivering and shoving it out there and giving. When people give, you know when they give. They give of themselves. It's something that belongs to them. They want to share. They want to share it with you. Giving is not delivering. Giving goes a lot further than that. Giving is something from the heart from the very inner of a person. Proverbs 22 verse 9 says, He that had a bountiful eye, a generous eye, shall be blessed. Why? For he giveth of his bread to the poor. He doesn't just give them bread. He gave them of his bread. His bread. It was his own. It was my own. It was your own. That is giving when you share that which you received to the other person. 22.9 says, He that hath a bountiful eye shall be blessed, for he giveth of his bread to the poor. It's easy to deliver things. It's easy to deliver a message. It is in many ways. But to give a message... And I'm not talking just about me. I'm talking about day to day, brothers and sisters, when we're in our daily lives, giving to someone else. That takes something. That takes something. Anyone can be a, a, a postmaster, if you like. You know, in our business, we have reps that we call catalog slappers because all they do is just deliver catalogs. 
They don't tell anyone about the products. They don't get into anything. They think their job is just to go and deliver product uh, catalogs. There's nothing in them to give to the other person, but the person that spends time investing in the other person, showing them what they've learned, then they're giving. And in our way, brothers and sisters, in our Christian life, surely we have to have, we have to, to go from ourself to give. Well, how do I grow? In, I want to witness better. I want to be a better person. I want to be a better preacher. Well, you've got to give. You can't just sit there. You've got to give from yourself. Every day, I don't know about us anymore, but many of us used to pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Why? Why do you want the bread? Why do you need the bread? Why do you need the bread? Because you want to give it. I pray that it'll be so. Give us this day our daily bread. You see, knowledge, words, scriptures is one thing to have. But what we do with that makes the difference. What we do with that knowledge what we do with those scriptures that have been engraved in our hearts and souls, that makes the difference. We have received much here. Amen. We have a whole library of truth and wisdom available to us anytime. It's all on the website, it's on YouTube, it's available. I'm sure if uh, no one could get it, someone else could download it and give it to them. It's on the radio. But what do we do with the bread that we receive, the meat that we receive, the truth that we receive? What do we do with that? You see, I believe that we're all very wise, I, I guess we could say, ripe spiritually. But what do we do with that? Do we give it? Do we give it? Because to give, once you give, then the Lord will give you in return are we giving because to receive more we have to give we have to give it we recently heard or have been discussing Peter and him and his vision in Acts chapter 10 about the sheet coming down we all remember that we've all been here I don't want to discuss it okay we don't want to stir any discussions up there was some good discussions there and over in verse 19 Chapter 10, 19, it says, While Peter thought on the vision, the Spirit said unto him, Behold, three men seek thee. Arise therefore and get thee down and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. How many of us want those types of vision? Now, as we, we talked about, as I said, I want to get into it. Some of us say they've had visions and others perhaps may struggle to say out aloud they've had visions. But how many of us would want to say that we've had those visions and the spirit, the spirit speaking like that? No doubt at all. Go with those men. He heard them. He went down. Hey, no doubt at all. How many of us would want those visions, those spirits speaking to them like that, so confident and sure? I want to get a better understanding. I want to get a way of sharing. I want to get a, a better knowledge. I want to get more excitement. Well, you've got to give. You have to give. You cannot just take. The rich monk, young man that came to Jesus, I want eternal life. He said, sell what you have. Give it to the poor. Come and follow me. Sell and give to the poor. Everyone wants something today, but so few want to actually give before they receive. Amen? That's right. It is easy to become selfish, but be fooled into thinking that I'm okay. I'm not selfish. And the easiest way to do that is simply compare yourself to someone else. Well, I, I, I give more than that person in that way. Do you know what I'm saying? The easiest way is to simply compare yourself to someone that's obviously not giving as much and then you feel better. It's easy to do that. It's easy to compare yourself with that type of person because obviously it makes you feel good, feels like you're justified. Brothers and sisters, we've been called to give, not compare, not judge ourselves against someone else to say, well, where am I on that ladder? How am I going? 
And you know, recently, even during this message, I was getting frustrated why I couldn't just piece all these things together. Yes, I know it's a message about giving. We all understand that. Yeah, Tim, we've been there. We've got to give our spiritual truth that we have. We can't receive. Blah, blah, blah. I've heard it before. It's not a physical thing. None of us here are rich, so it obviously hasn't worked, even if we tried it. And I was getting frustrated to try and understand what this giving was truly about until I realized it's not a deliverance. It's a giving from your heart. It's about truly giving that which is in you to someone else, not wanting anything in return. The Bible says, give and it shall be given. But yet it is so easy to fool yourself and to think, I'm not selfish. I, I give my time. I come on Sunday. Well done. I mean that. That's how I felt. Well, well what God do you want from me? I, I'm preparing and, and, I, and I truly, brothers and sisters, I was frustrated. But how much of my time do I spend on other things? How much of my week is spent on this and on that? How much is, as I say, well, I'll just, uh, who's, who's not here? Oh, well, Jono. I compare myself to Jono and he only comes Sunday morning. Well, hey, I'm ahead. It's easy to do. Oh, well, I give more. You know, I go and see everyone on Sunday morning and say, hello, how are you? That's nothing. That's not giving. I mean, I'm talking about investing our time every single day. My time every single day into those people that were working for me, investing in them, not Amalek and their products, but hey, spiritual life, spiritual life, priority number one. That's what I want. And it's up to you what you do with this message. It's up to you what you give and what you deliver and how you feel about the whole thing. But giving is more than just delivering. Giving is more than just reading scriptures. Giving goes deeper than the skin. It goes to the heart. I'm reminded of something that gives a picture of giving without compromise. The ox is a creature great in power and potential. Amen? Physically, it's not attractive. Physically, it's not a beautiful creature. Physically, it is nowhere near as elegant as a horse, right? Or many other things. It can't jump. You know, I've never seen an ox jump like horses or any of the other things do. There's nothing special about it. It doesn't have hidden talents. But the ox is a perfect example of giving. It's strong. It's consistent. It's not fast. It doesn't plow a field as probably as fast as perhaps a horse may, but it can go longer. It can go deeper. It doesn't give up. It goes every day nonstop. It can work in a group without any fuss at all. It's useful for plowing fields, for transport, for threshing. The ox gives all it has to give and ox is for nothing in return. I've never seen an ox saying, I want a car, I want a house, I want this or that, I want a cover. The ox gives all it has and ox is for nothing but obviously food in return. And even after the ox has passed its years and dies, it's useful for clothing, it's useful for meat. The ox gives its life. The ox gives past its life, I should say, and beyond. Brothers and sisters, I believe we ought to be just like the ox. Just like the oxen. We don't need great tricks. We don't need speed. We don't need eloquence. We don't need to look that great. Or do anything special in particular. God doesn't ask for the attractive, eloquent people of this life. But He wants your strength. He wants your consistency. And if, your head, if you put your head into the yoke like He asks, He requests, Take my yoke upon you, for my burden is easy and my yoke is light. He says, For I am meek and lowly in heart. Is that right? Put your head into the yoke with Christ. To give spiritually, to work with your brethren. 
and He will give you all that you would ever need spiritually in return. You know, many of us think we're inadequate, lack in confidence. I lack in confidence all the time. And I might know things, and I'm talking even in work or uh, uh, to do with the Word, but I lack that confidence. You know, I know it, but I lack the confidence. And many of us, I'm sure, are the same in that. Okay, I'm, not, I'm just being honest here. Is that we know, but we lack the confidence. That's because our confidence is not meant to be in us. It's not meant to be about us and who we are and and the type of person, what we look like and what we can do. It's because our head is in the yoke with the Lord that we should be able to have confidence in His Word and His truth and to give to people what they truly need. How many of us want to be of such great use to and by God so that even after... We are gone. The things that we did, the things that we said, the things that we gave go on to bless and to give to people just like the ox. It was gone, but it was still of use. The things that we did, we said and we gave were still a blessing and still working to the glory of God. There's plenty of examples and they're all in the Word. What they did, what they said, what they gave lived on past their death. Oxen were good to plough, to sow the seeds thereafter. They were good for transport, to good for help. They were good to thresh, to divide the wheat up. But they simply gave. And even though they might have had a hard day, even though they might have been kicked or had a rough field to plough, the next day they gave again. I hope that we understand oxen and their blessing. So many claim to be givers, but simply are takers in this life. Daniel 4, uh, 29 to 30, it talks about Nebuchadnezzar. And um, you can read it in your own time, but of course, read about how he was walking in his palace, began to boast of himself, how great he was, how wonderful and mighty he was, and the things that he had done. And it says in verse, uh, it says, Is not this great Babylon that I have built for the house of the kingdom by, my, by the might of my power and for the honour of my majesty? You know, it's good for us to think sometimes. Really think. I'm not just talking to the surface. I'm, really think. Is it by our work or our effort or our ways that we bless others? Because Nebuchadnezzar thought he was the man that did all this. He was the excellency and the mightiest. And he was boasting there. And of course, we know what happened to him. God sent him out into the field. Actually, let's turn there because I don't have it written down. Daniel 4. Daniel 4, verse 31 to 34. The word was still in the king's mouth. He was still yet boasting. And there fell a voice from heaven saying, O King Nebuchadnezzar, to thee it is spoken. The kingdom is departed from thee. They shall drive thee from men. Thy dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. Now shall eat, shall make thee to eat grass as oxen. And seven times shall pass over thee until thou knowest the most high ruleth in the kingdom of men and giveth it to whomsoever he will. The same hour was therefore fulfilled upon Nebuchadnezzar and he was driven from men and did eat grass of his oxen and his body was wet with the dew of heaven till the hairs were grown like eagle's feathers and his nails like bird's claws. And the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, this is his testimony, lifted up mine eyes unto heaven and mine understanding returned unto me and I blessed the Most High and I praised and honoured him that lived forever whose dominion is an everlasting dominion and his kingdom is from generation to generation and all the inhabitants of the earth are are, uh, reputed as nothing and he doeth according to them, according to his will in the army of heaven among the inhabitants of the earth. None can stay with his hand or say unto him, what doest thou? The last verse he says, and those that walk in pride he is able to obey. This was a testimony of a man that was... uh, Obviously so prideful, so boasting, so arrogant that he thought he was the very one 
that could achieve anything, could do anything. Need to read Nebuchadnezzar's testimony. Take a page from his book. I am nothing without the King of Kings, he came back. His testimony, I am nothing without the King of Kings. His testimony was that it was all God's glory. So I ask you, are you giving to people, to men, to women? Are you giving to the brothers, to the sisters? Giving. When I was about 17, I went to a uh, Vanuatu and I was at a church on Sunday morning and Sunday night. They have lovely voices. They, uh, I didn't understand a lot of what they were saying. One, one song I could understand what they were saying because in the verse, uh, their, their language is quite um, similar to English in some ways. And it was... Um, Fill my cup, Lord, the song. So that was the only part I could join in was actually in the verse. Uh, sorry, in the um, chorus. And I went there on Sunday morning and I went there on Sunday night and they sang that song over and over and over. I, I mean, it was one of those places where it was great to hear them, but in the end, those places you can kind of feel like, okay, we've sung that song. I don't understand it in any of the verses, but it's great in the chorus and that'll be enough. The words are, fill my cup, Lord, for those of you who don't know. Fill my cup, Lord. I lift it up, Lord. Come and quench this thirsting soul of mine. Bread of heaven, feed me till I want no more. Fill my cup, fill it up, and make me whole. And over and over they sang that song. And you know what? We can be just like them. Not necessarily in the song, but in our lives. In our lives. Lord, give me the bread, give me the bread, give me the bread, give me the bread. Do you think that God really just wants to give a person that's consistently asks and never gives would you? Let me ask, would you? To receive, we have to give. To receive, we have to give. It's easy to be the same. Lord, give me bread, give me bread, give me bread. But if we want our cup to fill up and our lives to be overflowing, we must give of ourselves, ourselves to others. I like that.